All right, welcome to all of you um, who are here right away. And hi, Lori. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're getting started a few minutes late, some technical difficulties. Uh, you all know how it is sometimes. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Lori, um, is it okay if I do a bit of an intro for you? Sure. Okay, so uh, Lori Kennedy, she says, first and foremost, is a mom to her two kids. I love that. Uh, she's also founder and CEO of the Wellness Business Hub and the host of the Empowered Practitioner podcast. The Wellness Business Hub's mission is to transform the lives of 100 million people globally by providing the necessary business and personal development skills, mentorship, and accountability to practitioners and coaches so they can transform lives for a living all on their own terms. Quite a mission that you have there. Mm -hmm. Yes. So today we're here to chat with Lori about all things business as a nutritionist. Um, we asked you folks as networking nutritionists uh, in our group to send in any questions ahead of time. So I've got a list of things here that our group members wanted to know about. Um, but for those of you who are here live, if you have questions as we go, please do feel free to pop those things into the chat or into the Q&A box and I'll keep an eye there as well. So welcome, Lori. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And I'm sorry for, for my technical difficulties. Zoom decided to do an update <laughs> as I was logging in. It's one of those, one of those things. Yes. Oh, I appreciate uh, you squeezing us into your busy day and being willing to join us even from the, the comfort of your car. The comfort of the car. Today is one of those days where I get to just be a mom and do an hour of work because my son's in some flag football something or other and um I am in the car not in an arena so I thought mm. it would be too noisy so there we go very nice well to start off with um I know a little bit about your story um but I'm curious to learn about you in a little more depth than I know um, I appreciate you have a, a pretty raw way of being you just say things how they are so I'm I'm curious to know um what would you like to share with people about your journey uh, that got you to where you are today in nutrition and business? I think that the thing that is most important is that your professional education is one half of what will enable you to have the kind of success that you want. And I know f when I was first coming out of school, I thought it was 100%. I thought as long as I have, you know, the piece of paper and the certification, and I was a personal trainer before I was a nutritionist, I had three different personal training certifications. And then I did a bunch of other, obviously, courses and whatnot, we all love to learn. And I thought that the the training and the education in the field as a nutritionist, as a trainer, um, that that was the thing that was going to get me clients. Um, and no, flat out no. Um, and it's not to say that it's obviously you need it, but you need it for when you have the clients and you need it to be able to provide education. But there's all of these little bits in between that no professional um, institution teaches because they don't teach business. That's not that's not what you are paying for. Um, except that it's not overtly known that you need those things. And so you come out and you're kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> what? Um, and especially in 2022 and moving into, you know, where the industry is going and, and not just our industry, but just, you know, alternative health and wellness mixed with technology, mixed with AI, mixed with marketing, all of that stuff. Like it's very different. I graduated in 2007. So from when I graduated to now, I mean, good gosh, like it's, it's a different so, world. It's so different. So I think that's what I would really like everybody to know is you need to be as obsessed with learning and executing business as you are with learning and executing about the body and wellness and health and all of that. Yeah, that makes sense. I agree. <laughs> Um, so the, one of the first questions that I had here kind of ties into that. Um, it said, what should someone who is just starting out focus on? And there was a little caveat, um, in brackets, especially if you're still employed at another job. 
Mm, okay. So the first thing that I would do, which it doesn't matter if you're employed at another job, it, it none of these things are, you know, I understand that that's where you are, but it's not relevant to sort of what you can and cannot do, um, is I would pick a niche and I would pick a problem that you focus on and I would start talking about it and I would start educating about it, whether that's on your personal Facebook page or some Instagram page, or you want to film little YouTube videos or TikTok or something, but that's where I would start. I, I would start really practicing communicating and educating and building an audience. Awesome. Uh, do you have preferences in terms of platforms that you like to use to to do that communicating? I think that um, using your Facebook personal page is the easiest, although I know a lot of people have feelings about that. Um, the Facebook personal page is the easiest because it's the one out of all the social media platforms. It's the one that's going to get the most organic engagement versus Instagram versus even TikTok. It's the one that is the easiest to get the content in front of other people. Even if, you know, the friends that you have on Facebook aren't your necessarily like your ideal client or the people that, you know, you really want to help, it doesn't matter. They will share it. If they comment on it, it's going to push it into the newsfeed. And so we're not going to worry about Auntie Debbie and, you know, best friend Jenny caring about what you're posting on your Facebook personal page. And I think this is something really challenging that a lot of practitioners and coaches struggle with. It's this idea of visibility and this idea of people who are supposed to support you and love you judging you because that happens. Um, and I think when you, you have to sort of accept the fact that when you are going to do this, especially if you're going to do this online, all social media assets, including your Facebook, your personal Facebook page, are now a part of your business assets. And I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent for just one more second, but I was having this conversation yesterday with a client and she was asking me what, how I personally use social media, which I thought was a very good question. And I said, that's actually a really interesting question. And I never thought about it this way. Me, Lori, as a person, not as the brand is not even on social media. I'm not on social media. Lori Kennedy is as the persona, as the person for business purposes. But me, like Lori Kennedy is like the mom and like the hockey mom and whatever. Like I'm not on social media personally. So whatever anybody sees on social media is because I allowed them to see it, right? Is because I curated it as part of the brand, as part of my education, as part of what I want you to see because it's going to help you in your journey in some way, shape or form, not because I'm showing cute pictures of my dog Tulip to my cousin Julie, right? And I think that's a lot of people can't have a really hard time wrapping their minds around that. Mm -hmm. I'm the same. Uh, I joke all the time that uh, I'm a bad millennial because social media is not my jam. Um, I have another question here. It said, um, let me find it. What was one of your biggest mistakes when you first started out? Oh God, um, I don't know. One, just one. Um, <laughs> I want to say something about mistakes and I'll say what it is. However, I got here because I made a lot of mistakes. I just want to say that. Like I got to where I am because I'm not afraid to make mistakes and I make really big ones, like costly, embarrassing, mortifying mistakes. The bigger the mistakes, the faster you get to where you want to go. So I just want to say that about mistakes in a little bit of a reframe. However, I would say the most costly mistake that wasn't actually valuable to me um, was spending a lot of money on a website. And I know that might sound like cliche or whatever, and you might all be like, well, how are you going to get clothes? Um, but honestly, I just now fix my website, which I had not posted on in like four years. Um, so, and I have like a very large business. So, and I had a website when I first started my nutrition business, I paid $5,000. I'll never forget this. And it like did nothing for me because the website in and of itself is not what gets you clients. And if you aren't, if you aren't SEO savvy, which in my opinion, when you're first starting is a complete waste of time, 
if you're not spending in this day and age in 2022, if you're not spending paid traffic like ads to drive traffic to your website, it's just this, another thing that you have to maintain when you have all of these social media assets that are already in front of your ideal clients that you should be spending time on. So the biggest mistake and the most costly mistake and the most time intensive mistake was focusing on a website, thinking that the website was the thing that was going to get me clients. I love that. It's a question actually that um, I get from a lot of our new nutritionists. Like, do I need to do a website? Yeah. No, not anymore. You don't. <laughs> Yeah, no, please don't. <laughs> so I love that. Um, I have another question here. It says, I'm not sure that I should start my own business. What mm -hmm. qualities do you think make a person right for entrepreneurship? I love this question. Me and too. whoever asked it, thank you for being so brave and knowing yourself and knowing yourself. And I'm going to say something that might sound a little bit mean, but most people aren't actually suited. Most people aren't, and they only figure that out like in year two or year three, and they're really amazing number twos. They're not suited to be a number one, and that's okay. That doesn't mean you failed. It doesn't mean you failed at all. I, I would never be where I, I am without a number two, a number three, a number four, and so on. And so qualities, that's such a good question. I love that you asked that. Qualities are you, can, you have to be able to um, make decisions quickly and take action and understand that you're going to look and feel like a moron most of the time. Um, because when, when you're doing this, unless you've already grown a business on the internet, um, you're doing everything for the first time for a long time, for years, for years, you're doing everything for the first time. And that takes a level of self-belief, that takes a level of resilience, that takes a level of stick fortitude, it takes a level of gumption, um, and just sheer, like, sheer will, because it's about three years before you really start to get into a groove. Three years. So if you're willing and capable of like climbing through the mud for three years while you feel uncomfortable, then you'll probably be successful. But if the, if here's on the flip side, if every single thing causes you to have a minor meltdown, and I mean that with genuine, like I mean it with respect, like if the thought of doing a Facebook live if you've been thinking about it for more than two days and you haven't done it yet, like instead of just like being like, okay, I got to do this. I'm going to do it and flip on your camera and just start talking. That's a, that's a trait. You have to be able to do that. You have to be able to just flip on your camera, write a little script, flip on your camera and do it. Like if you, if you struggle with those things, then more than likely you're going to have a very hard time because that's everything. Every walking into a room, pitching yourself to a podcast, getting on an enrollment call with a client, all of these things take that level of discomfort. I love that you focused on discomfort. Uh, I've said that many, many times over the years that I feel like this is not just true for entrepreneurship either, but um, societally, we need to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we have climate controlled houses now and like, God forbid we ever have to walk anywhere. And we're just so used to being in comfort all the time that for a lot of people, that lifestyle that comes along with entrepreneurship, it's so foreign. Like yeah. it's, it's just not something that we're used to. Agreed. Yeah. We also had a couple questions about fear. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of ties in with what we're talking about here as well. Um, so the first one was, how do you shake off the fear of selling? Um, and sort of secondary to that was, how can you move past your fear, especially if you've already had a business that failed? Mm, okay. So my first thought is, why is fear bad? Like, why is that something you even have to shake off? Right? And I think, again, it goes back to the, what we were just saying. So you're uncomfortable. Okay. Like, and, right? And I think that's one of the things, especially I've worked with thousands of women from all over the world, 
all ages, all backgrounds, I think we're conditioned to be small. We're conditioned. I can say that. I've worked with thousands of women. We're conditioned to stop the moment that we think we're not going to be good at something because heaven forbid we make a mistake and then we are a failure. So it's not, it's not unique to any single person. I think that it's a huge problem. Um, so the thing about fear is that it never totally goes away because we have egos, we're human beings. Um, and so it never really goes away. The le- like, I wish, I believe me, I wish it would, but it, it doesn't. And the other thing that I would say too, and then I'll tell you actually how is these things that you're so afraid of are naturally occurring things that happen in business people are going to say no to you people will complain they're normal they're normal things they're normal occurring things that happen to every single business owner whether you're online or offline and so we don't need to fear them and so here's the lesson the reason you fear them is because you actually don't know how to handle it and you don't believe and you're nervous that you will mess it up that you will make a mistake that you will look like an idiot it all comes down to basically looking like an idiot you don't want to look unprofessional you don't want to look like you don't know you don't want to have an emotional reaction and it's because you're not you don't have the skill set which good news you can learn it you don't have the skill set to be able to handle those situations so when you are skilled at sales which you can learn you don't fear it anymore because you understand the purpose of the conversation you understand how to navigate harder more challenging more objection-based conversations and you become very proud of yourself for being able to navigate those really challenging objection-filled conversations so there's no fear of sales I think when you're afraid of something it's because you've never done it before and you don't know how to do it. And so that, you know, goes for investing, that goes for talking to your family about what you want to do, that goes for sales, that goes for, you know, customer service, client delivery, all of those scenarios are, we label it as fear, but really, again, it just goes back to discomfort and not wanting to show up like we don't know what we're doing. Yeah, I agree with that. Do you have any thoughts on the second part? um, How to move past if you've had a business that failed? Oh, yes. Thank you for that. Um, So, okay. Before I would even jump into anything, I would do a hard look at why it failed. I would look in the mirror and be brutally honest with yourself. And then I would actually go and work with some type of consultant who understands the metrics of business. Because here's the thing, and this might sound a little like, uh, I don't know, like short-sighted, it's just math. Like at the end of the day, you need a, it's math and skills and the willingness to execute. But on paper, it's math. So if the business failed, it's it's because you didn't have enough leads, your pricing wasn't accurate, or you didn't make enough sales, period. Because even if what you sold was crap and you still made enough sales, the business wouldn't have failed, right? So it's really like on paper, it's actually quite simple. It's obviously, you know, challenging when you don't have the skills. So I would look at, was it a lead problem? Did you not have enough people coming in every single month? Was it a pricing problem? Did you not charge enough because you didn't understand your expenses? So before you even, you know, get started into something new, I would understand why it was that I wouldn't even say failed, why it was that it didn't work because it not, it wasn't a failure if you if you can learn from it, right? It wasn't, it's not a failure. It's just a thing you did that didn't work out. <laughs> right? It's just a thing you, I have many things that I do that don't work out. Um, um, And so I would really, I would take this opportunity and not just like, you know, be sad about it, but actually be like, okay, I'm going to act as a professional business owner here. And I'm going to do an audit on why this didn't work out so that you don't make the same mistake again, because I guarantee if you don't do that, you will make the same mistake again. Yeah. So true. Yeah. On, on that point of having a look in the mirror, uh, the next question was, how can I decide on a business idea if I'm just not sure what to do or what I'm even good at? 
Mm, oh, I love that. Oh, well, um, okay. Well, there's a couple ways you can investigate and research different like business models, right? So you can, you can look at different people that you admire, that you maybe relate with in terms of like core values or whatever. And, and you can sort of look at what they're doing and think like, would this be enjoyable to me? Like knowing yourself and knowing what you like to do, you know, knowing if you like, you know, if you, if you like gardening, if you use a lot of products, if you like writing, if you like performing in front of people, like what do you like to do in terms of skills and behaviors and traits? And then I would go and investigate different business models that would resonate with you. Um, and I would just, I would just start, right? I would just start. I would start, um, I would start, I would dabble. I mean, here's the other thing too, is like, I think people think that they have to have this whole like master plan all figured out and like a secret that those of us that have achieved, you know, some level of success is quite honestly, we literally are paving the road as we're driving down it. You know, we have a, there's a plan, but it's mathematics on paper. It's, I need this many leads. I need to make this many sales. Like it's paper. But at the end of the day, how you achieve that is, is sort of trial and error. I mean, having a, a plan that you can model. So let's say what I, you know, what I teach and what I talk about is having an online signature program. So that's just like one model. There's the affiliate model. You still need a product. There's a membership site right? There's that. You can go become an influencer. That's another business model, right? You can, you can do direct sales. That's another business model. So there's all of these options. Um, and I think you have to think about like what you're good at and what you want your lifestyle to be and pick one and start and be like, oh, this is fab or, oh, I don't actually like this. And then you go and you pick a different one. Yes. Yeah, it's true. And I think, um, for for those of us who are more entrepreneurial, there can be that sort of like perfectionist uh, quality frequently as well. So thinking way too far ahead a lot of the time and anyone who has had any kind of staying power in any career, even if it's not as an entrepreneur, things shift and things change and that's totally okay and to be yep. expected. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, we had someone ask, there are so many nutritionists out there. How can you make sure you differentiate yourself from others? Do you know what's so funny? I think about this all the time and people tell me all the time, like the market is so saturated and I'm like, no, it's really not. And this is going to sound mean. There's so many nutritionists at the bottom of the mountain. But if you went up one level, it's not crowded. It's not crowded. There's so many people who are at the base of the mountain looking up and are saying, I wish I was there. I wish I was there. And then there's other people who were like, cool, I'm going to get myself there. And then they like walk up the mountain. But the rest of y'all are standing there being like, I wish, I wish, I wish. And you never take a step. And that's why it feels so crowded. And if you go into a Costco or you go into a Walmart or you go to Great Wolf Lodge or you go anywhere, you will see that despite all the nutritionists and despite all the free information, right? There are way more unhappy, unhealthy, sick people than all of us could combined could even help. Mm -hmm. So it seems that way because that's who you surround yourself with. So is that, is that your experience or is that true? Right. And so how you differentiate yourself is by just actually doing it, is by talking about it, is by sharing your experience, is by being yourself. And I know that sounds cliche and I know that's what everybody says, but it's the truth. And so too many people are afraid to do that because they're afraid of being judged for who they are. So they don't ever start, right? They don't ever start or they do it for two weeks and they're like, oh, it's not working. And then they stop. Um, and so how you differentiate yourself is to become really good at what you do. 
It's to become really good at what you do and to care and to care a lot and to do the right thing and to build up a good reputation and to show up even when you don't want to and to not worry about giving the farm away for free and to actually, you know, execute on the on sort of the promise that you made by being able to help people no matter what. And you show up and you show up and that's how you differentiate yourself. Connie just put in the chat, there's almost 8 billion people in the world. I wonder how many nutritionists there are. Right? Yeah, so true. Like, you know, go, like, it's funny. I, 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 I think about this like video series that I want to do, which I will probably make very soon where I like go into Costco with a microphone and be like, have you ever worked with a nutritionist? And they're going to be like, no. And then you go to the next person and be like, have you ever worked with a health coach? And they'll be like, no. And I'll be like, have you ever worked with a naturopath? And they'll be like, what's a naturopath? <laughs> you know, like, I think we think that it's so saturated because it's the world we live in. If you step outside your own experience, you will see that it's not that way. Yeah, absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, next question on my list. What do you say to someone who thinks they don't know enough to start a program, a course, or a business? <laughs> um I want to qualify this for a second but they have like some type of designation like they're a nutritionist yes everyone who put in questions is a nutritionist okay fab yeah so here's the thing this is a good one too and this goes back to your own perspective why do you think that right what and this is like you have to look in the mirror like why do you think you don't know enough look at how many people are sick in this world right? And I give the example of hydration, right? I always give this example because this is the thing, right? If I could just get you to believe that you're like smart enough, good enough that you can do this. Um, and I give the example of hydration. I'm like, if you, you devalue how much you know, because it's your experience, because it's the way that you live it's because you've already gone through it this is part of your identity and so you completely devalue your own experience and your own knowledge so think about how life-changing it is for someone to be properly hydrated it's life-changing people pay for that kind of information and here you are sitting on tons and tons of knowledge and expertise and personal experience and growth and development and there are people who struggle to drink water you don't think that you know enough to be able to help somebody to become hydrated of course right no one's asking you about phase two liver detox zero people no one right no one they're not asking you about the hpa access they're just like what time should i go to bed so I don't feel so stressed, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no one's asking you about that. And even if they did, you could be like, this is what it is in two sentences. And they'd be like, cool. Right. And so I think we devalue how far we've come because it's such a part of who we are now that we forget how valuable that, that is to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was in when I was in nutrition school, so like you back in the late 2000s. Um, and I had an instructor who they, the way that they framed it was you only have to be one step ahead of someone to be able to help them. And for whatever yes. reason that always stuck with me. And I repeat that to nutritionists as much as I can, because yes. it, it's so true. Yes. I say, I say that all the time. It's the 10 it's the 10% expert rule. I actually say 10 steps ahead. I say it's the 10% expert rule. It says, if you are 10 steps ahead, you can absolutely help somebody because you're 10 steps ahead, right? You're 10 steps ahead. If you have a piece of paper, which let's be real, most of us have multiple pieces of paper, multiple. We've read multiple books, right? If you have a piece of paper that qualifies you, you're more than 10 steps ahead. You just don't realize it because it's what you eat, live, sleep, breathe for years and years and years. Go walk into a Walmart. Go walk into a Walmart, right? We forget. We forget how far we've come. We forget. So you mentioned earlier um, that signature programs is um, a model that you work with a lot. So we did have a question um, come in. What are some of the first steps to take if you want to create a signature program? 
Yeah, so the first step that you would take is to pick a niche and a painful problem, because when you create an online program, you're really doing it to solve that painful problem. And so that way you're really putting together a protocol um, for, for solving that painful problem. So that's, I mean, before you can go, I mean, if you don't have a, a target, if you don't have a focus, you can't obviously create a program because you would just be putting random things together, which is not helpful for anybody. Okay. Um, next, sort of in the same vein, are there mm -hmm. any must-have platforms or software that you recommend working with? Um, something that you just wouldn't want to do business without? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we call this a tech stack. Um, and so it's just the tech platforms that sort of stack on top of each other. So number one is Google Drive. My, every single document, spreadsheet, video, everything is in Google Drive and my whole team has access to it. Um, this is really important. Even if you, it's just you yourself and you, eventually you will, if you continue, you will have people that help you and you don't want to be the bottleneck because it's on your desktop. That sucks. So Google Drive. 100% uh, could not live without that. Um, some type of email marketing platform. So you have to use an email marketing platform. We recommend Active Campaign. Um, it's illegal for you to collect email addresses and send email marketing through like Gmail or whatever. Um, so you must use an email marketing campaign, uh, email marketing platform. Again, we recommend Active Campaign. Zoom, obviously. Um, we also uh, recommend Practice Better or Better um as like a like an emr if you're going to be working one-to-one -one with clients or patients um so we recommend that to a lot of our practitioners and coaches you need obviously a merchant so you need like paypal or stripe or venmo or something like that um you need some type of marketing platform. So we recommend ClickFunnels, um, but you need something where you can like have opt-in pages and sales pages and things like that, that are really easy and that are high converting. Um, so we use, so ClickFunnels, ActiveCampaign, Stripe, Zoom, G Drive, Amazon S3 is also a cloud hosting platform where we host a lot of things on there. Um, I use Slack. So Slack is like a communication, like a chat thing for my team. Um, I use Asana, A-S-A-N-A for project management. Those are basically the things that like I couldn't run my business without and my calendar. <laughs> yes, you gotta have a calendar. Yes, everything's in the calendar. Uh, so you mentioned niching, um, choosing a problem as a good first step for the signature program. So how, Im how important do you think it is to have a niche was the question and how specific do they need to be? Um, so I think it's very important to have a niche, even if you're in a clinical practice. I operate under sort of this whole like work smarter, not harder thing. Um, because I don't like doing any work that I don't have to do. And I think when you don't have a niche, you're scrambling. A lot of the times you're reactive to every single person that comes in. You cannot rinse and repeat anything because everything is different for every single person. You're doing way too much admin work. Um, and I hate admin work and I don't do it. So that would suck for me. Um, so I think that having a niche allows you to simplify everything, frankly. And it also allows you to get really good at talking to a specific type of person and deeply connecting with them, which feels really fulfilling versus this like superficial revolving door of strangers that never come back to you. Um, what was the second part of the question? Sorry. I got curious uh, with like the niche. How specific do you Oh, how specific. To be? Thank you. I'm like super passionate about everybody having a niche. So I forgot. Um, how specific? It doesn't matter when you start. The point is to pick one because if I said very specific, then you uh, you and you aren't specific, then you won't do anything. So it doesn't matter. What matters is that you pick something and you just start. And if you need to get more specific over time, you will. Maybe you don't need to. I don't know. But you. the point is, is you just need to pick one and start. Yeah. Just do it. Yes. Yes. Just uh, 
Yeah. Next on my list was how do you choose the right name for your business or your program? Um, I'll make it real simple for you. Just use your name and add the word coaching to the end of it or wellness. Um, you want to keep it as generic as possible because if you do decide to change directions or change this, um, then it's your name and then you can get your social ha media handles as your name because when people are going to refer to you, they're going to refer to you as your name. Um, and then that way it's easy. So you can use your name as like the overall brand and then come up with names for your programs. And those would be branded. And don't pick anything cute. It has to be very clear as to what you do. So like, don't call it wellness sunflower. Like nobody knows what that means, right? Um, so just pick something that's very clear, like migraine support, <laughs> something that's very clear. Okay, love that. Uh, in a Q&A box, uh, it says, what do you see the trend moving towards after we have been through uh, this last two years? Do you see virtual being more important or is there still a place for in-person? Um, it's a really good question. I don't know that I see, okay, obviously there's a place for in-person. There has to be. Um, I do see virtual. I I see virtual, but not the maybe the way that you're thinking about it. I see virtual AI. I see virtual apps. Like I'm a huge tech nerd. So I love studying like tech trends and whatever. Wearable technology is huge. And there's a lot of money to be made in that industry. And I think we're at the forefront of these types of technologies. Um, so I think that because because what covid did was it sped up user ability it forced all of us to go online and to become comfortable in this type of setting right where now everyone is like well do i have to come can we not just zoom right can we not just zoom like you know board mem board meetings where they used to sit there stuff like this right where it's like sure I'll do it no nope. like if you would have asked me to come downtown I would have said no right or go where if you would ask me to go anywhere I would have been like no sorry I can't my son's in a thing you want an hour of my time sure I'll sit in the car you know what I mean so I think that I think we have to realize what what COVID did was it really accelerated tech, the use of technology and all of our comfort levels with technology. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think where we're going is this mix of coaching and technology. I think we all have to become better coaches and not so much a practitioner because that's, again, that's very black and white, right? It's, it's very um, like, oh, this, and then you try this, and then you try this, but it's the coaching, it's the execution, it's getting them to actually do the things. So I think the future is in coaching, is in simplifying it down and in, and in using these technologies to make execution and compliance much easier over time, right? Where if I'm wearing a, a, a technology and I'm, you know, this is, I'm working with a nutritionist, they can see my movement. They can see my calories. They can see it all, right? And it's going to force me to do it because I know somebody's watching me, right? It's accountability. It's what we all need. Nobody needs more information. Everybody knows they need to drink water and not eat McDonald's. Like, let's be real. Do you know what I mean? And why are people still eating McDonald's? Because coaching, accountability, support. Dealing yeah. with their stuff, right? Dealing with their stuff. So, uh, yeah. I really love that distinction um, because it, to your point, technology has opened up so many opportunities for us in the wellness industry. Mm -hmm. I even thinking back, um, we did a webinar last month with That Clean Life. Um, when I was first graduated as a nutritionist, we were making meal plans by hand and like you were calculating, <laughs> right? How many carrots somebody had to buy at the grocery store and it took so long. So those sorts of things have freed up so much of our time for that human element to your point. Like, what are the things that only you can do as a person, as a coach, as a nutritionist? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely. And so it's this blend of really utilizing technology, not even just for your clients, but for your own business. And then really getting good at coaching. This next question, I feel like you're going to have some strong thoughts about, and <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for them. I hope everyone else is. Uh, it says all through school, I kept hearing how quote nutritionists don't get into this field to make money or you're not going to make big bucks in the industry. And I'm finding it hard to break through those blocks. Any tips? They still say that, right? <laughs> I would just turn around and run. Honestly, like who still says that? Why would you do anything to not make really good money? Like, honestly, then you know what? Okay, here's the distinction. You have to make a decision. Is this a hobby or is this a business? It's just a distinction, right? I don't know who's saying that. That's ridiculous. That's just nonsense. But and like, I'm working very hard for that to not be a thing anymore. Like my whole reason for doing this is so that that phrase doesn't no longer exist in this industry where you can absolutely be of tremendous service and be wildly wealthy at the same freaking time. And it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Um, however, what I would say is how do you get over that? You decide, you have to decide. Is this going to be a hobby for you? Maybe I'll make a couple bucks at it. Cool, fun. You know, I think of like going to like flea markets and like selling your wares. You know what I mean? Like that's like a hobby, right? Where you like help a couple clients once a month and maybe you make like a couple hundred bucks, thousand dollars. Cool, that's a hobby. That's a hobby. But if you want this to be successful, then you actually have to go into it like you're building a business and it's the business of nutrition. You're not a nutritionist, you are a business owner and the, the, the menu is nutrition, right? It's like a chef opens a restaurant, not just to cook food. They know they're going into, they know a restaurant's a business. They're not doing it because of just for their love of cooking. If they just loved cooking, they would just cook for family and friends. It's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. So Whoever's saying that to you is saying that to you because they're broke. <laughs> That's why. And they're trying to justify it because I can promise you this. Any of us who actually make money would never dare say that. No, no, totally agreed. Uh, we have a question here asking, how important is social media? Can someone have a successful business without a social media presence? Yes. 100%. You can. It's just easier with social media, right? What I will say is you need an audience. You need an audience. So whether that's on social media or whether you are pitching yourself to every single women's group that's in your city and you're going and you're doing speaking gigs and you're getting clients that way and you, they, you're, you aren't on social media, cool. But it you need an audience. So either you're going to use social media to build an audience or you're going to go and grassroots it somewhere offline to build an audience. But either way, in order to get clients, you need to have people, you need to have eyeballs. You can't be sitting in a room manifesting and then all of a sudden, bam, clients appear like that doesn't happen. Right. So you need to get yourself in front of an audience. Do you absolutely need social media? No. Um, and, um, no. On the, on the same topic, um, another question, do I have to be the face of social media or can I put out content without being in front of the camera? Oh, you can totally put out content without, well, that's, wait, that's a trick question. Okay. That's a trick question because what the question really should be, do I need to be a personal brand? Or can I be a nameless face? You need to be, you, you yourself need to be the brand. Does your face need to appear on video? No. You can write content. You can share pictures. Do you need to do video? No. Should you do video? Yes. Um, but no. And here's what I want to say to all of these questions. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. You can, there's always a way to figure it out. 
always. So please let's just, I don't like video. I can't be successful. I don't like this. I can't, I'm not going to be on social media. I can't be successful. It's all garbage. You're just telling yourself. It's just a story you're telling yourself. You can be very successful any way you want, as long as you show up and do it consistently over time. Yeah. Love that. Uh, in the Q and A box, we've got another question on the note of presenting to groups in person. Do you have a suggested fee for your time when starting out? Presenting to groups in person, like in seminars. Yeah, you mentioned like going to the women's groups and using oh, I would that as your free. audience. I would do it for free. I wouldn't even charge. I wouldn't charge because I think. Well, I guess it depends, right? Can you make more money charging or can you make more money get, doing it for free and getting clients? So if you're going to charge them $150, are they going to let you pitch? Are they going to let you collect email addresses? I think it's not, it's not a black or white question. It's what's the intent? You know, if somebody's inviting you to come and do a corporate talk, sure, charge, right? Charge, I, I wouldn't even offer a fee. I'd ask them what their budget is. Always ask what the budget is because you will most certainly undervalue yourself. So you go in and you say, sure, I'd love to do this. What's the budget? And if they say, well, we don't really have one, then you can make a decision. Or if they're like, well, it's between $500 and $1,000, you can be like, great, $750, right? So you always ask what the budget is. Me, even, I mean, I'm not being paid to do this, right? So even me, I think it's like, I would rather give a, an hour of my time for free um, then have to like negotiate. I mean, even when I was, even when I didn't have money, I was pitching myself left, right, and center. I just wanted to get in front of people's audiences. Like, you know, and if they said, what's your fee, then I would more than likely say, don't worry. I'm happy just to do it for free to get in front of your audience because then, that, then they have a very hard time saying no. <laughs> Um, it, if you do want to charge, however, I would charge somewhere between 200 and 500 bucks. Yeah, that's a good number. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. Another question in the Q and A box, what are some components that your signature program should include? Sometimes there's a lot of fluff, but what's really essential to bring to your client. Um, action tasks. So what we teach inside of the programs that we work with our practitioner and coach clients are is you need action tasks. You need to be able to actually instruct the client. So if you are not able to, and this why this is why we have to start with some type of focus, painful problem that we're getting rid of, because if you weren't able to, to sit in front of that person and talk to them, what would you be able to tell, what would you tell them to do that will be able to get them the results? So that's the best way to think about it. Don't teach them things. Nobody cares about why it's important to be hydrated. They just want to know how to do it. Right. Again, nobody cares about HPA access. They just want to know how to stop feeling stressed, right? All the time. So it's like, what action tasks are you going to give to your clients that they can actually comply with and do? That's the most important thing. Another question in the Q&A box here. Do you suggest having a few offerings besides a bigger signature program for someone that doesn't want to spend a lot of money, like a product ladder? Um, yes, yes. And this goes back to, again, you know, it's a business question because if you're, if you're, is it because, okay, so yes, it's always nice to have things that are reasonably priced and when you only have things that are reasonably placed or when you default to the things that are reasonably placed because you don't know how to overcome money objections, you're going to have a very hard time growing your business because you're always going to be scraping by because you just sold something for 150 bucks when you should have sold it for 1500 or 2500 or 5000 right? But that's like an internal situation. Sure. Can you have them? Yep, absolutely. But they're a down sell after the person says no to the big thing. Um, one of the last questions that I have here about business, and then I want to end on a bit of a personal note. Uh, the question says, they say you have to spend money to make money. What is your advice for someone who isn't able or willing to spend a lot of money on outsourcing, advertising platforms, et cetera? Um... Well, 
go and make money. <laughs> um, honestly, is my first thing would be like, go sell 10 consults at 150 bucks. Go do that. And then you have $1,500. And that basically covers it for the entire year, right? For most of the platforms. Um, okay, well, is it that they can't or they didn't want to? It said um, for someone who isn't able and then in brackets or willing. So, all right. <laughs> so now you're going to get like tough love from me. Um, if you're not willing, then why are you even asking that question? Like, why are you here? Honestly, like then that, then it's a hobby and there's nothing to talk about. You don't need any money because it's a hobby. Although hobbies cost money. Um, most hobbies actually cost money. Um, but you don't need an email marketing platform. You're just like helping friends and family when asked and you're like spreading the good word, you know? So it, it I'm not going to answer that question because I think the only way for me to answer that question is you have to decide if you're actually going to do this as a business because businesses have startup costs. They absolutely do. Never mind tech platforms, liability insurance. You need liability insurance, right? You need to open up a business bank account. Like there's expenses that come along with starting a business. And so if you're not willing to incur those expenses, then you're not willing to start a business, period. Yeah, I think to um, to speak a little bit to the able part, like it, it to an extent, if you want to have your own business and become an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. you have to kind of find the way. Like I know when I was first starting out, that meant I was working like three jobs at once and squirreling yeah. things away so that I had the money to start the things that I wanted to do. And so, you know, if it's less of a willing problem and more of an able problem, you still have to be willing to go and do the extra stuff. Um, if Because like you said, even the basics, they have costs. They have costs. And again, it comes back to a decision, right? It comes back to a decision. And I think a level of clarity of what you're getting yourself into. And I, and, and again, like, I remember thinking, like, I remember I can picture where I was even when I realized that this was a business. Like, genuinely, I was standing in chapters, looking at a Zig Ziglar book, holding a coffee and being like, I was in the business section. And then I saw all of his books and I it dawned about sales. And I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. And so that really like it flipped the switch for me I was like oh like this is how I need to move forward now like right and then I started to learn I bought business books like y'all have you bought business books like have you bought actual business books right have you bought like fundamentals of business right like if you've not bought those books, then like, yeah, it makes sense. You're struggling, you know, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we end up, we've got a few more minutes. Um, oh, so Sabine just threw in the chat. What's your favorite business book? Oh God. Do you have one? Um, what's my favorite? I would say the one that I talk about the most is the Rockefeller Habits by Vern Harnish. That's like a hardcore business book. Um, and also The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace D. Waddles. Nice. Yeah. Um, so what I was going to say um, is you've got some really cool offerings right now. Do you want to share a little bit about those before we get into the last question, which is a more personal one? Sure. So I think the best thing to do would be to just come and join our Empowered Practitioner Facebook group. Um, I think that's the best thing. You can search for it on Facebook. It's just the Empowered Practitioner. You can, you know, search my name, you'll find it. That's, I think, the best way to get access to everything that we do um, ongoing. And right now we are, um, what day is it today? The third. So I'm three days into launch a Palooza, which is, um, I guess like a, uh, I don't even know a multi-day event, let's call it, um, where I am taking you from the very beginning of like niching and picking all of these things. And then we're walking through sort of how to, how to establish yourself, right. How to do it correctly from the start so that you don't 
spend time and money, for example, on a website that does nothing. Um, and if you have one, how to fix it so that it actually does something for you. Um, and all of these things. So that's, I think, the the best way to find us is either through my um, Facebook group or you can also follow me on Instagram. I'm at Lori Kennedy Inc. And then that way you are up to date and in the know. Beautiful. So yeah. the more personal question here, uh, it says, what does a day in your life look like? And I feel like we're getting a sneak peek in your car. Um, but do you have any tips for how to structure your day? Like how you schedule your business related tasks, kids, home? Sure. Um, my days, most of the time, although I do different things every day, they're pretty groundhoggy. Like I have groundhog day. I wake up at five every day. I work from five to seven. Then I turn into mummy and I do mummy things from seven to eight 30. And then I come home and I walk the dog for 45 minutes, um, from usually like a, I don't really have anything scheduled ever before 10 so that I have sort of that time between 8 30 and 10 to like eat walk the dog collect myself for the day that kind of thing because I had already worked for two hours in the morning and then usually from 10 although Mondays I start at 9 um 10 until 3 um I am on Mondays is my meetings and coaching day same thing on so Mondays and Wednesdays I fill my calendar with like I call them my zoom days so I'm basically sitting on my ass on zoom whether I'm in a meeting or I'm coaching clients or I'm working with my team or whatever the case may be Wednesdays are longer days for me because my kids go to their dads and I don't have to pick them up from school um and so that's Mondays and Wednesdays um Tuesdays is usually a content day. So that's where I'm either brainstorming content, I'm writing content, or I'm creating content. Thursday is usually some type of like execution day in the sense of like, I'm doing webinars or I'm doing, you know, things like this, like recording podcasts, stuff like that, um, meeting with my team, catching up. And then we work off of a four day work week. So Friday is a flex day. So Friday usually for me is about, again, 5 a.m. Um, I probably work from, like, after I drop the kids off, like, from 10 until, like, 1. And then I usually do something for myself between 1 and 3. So, like, either I'll go for, like, a long walk or I'll go for a hike with the dog um, or I'll go eat lunch or do something, manicures, whatever, from 1 to 3 on Fridays. And then I pick up the kids. Um, I no longer work at night. So that's fun. Um, sometimes I have to work on the weekends and that's okay. I don't mind. Um, but that's really it. And that's, you know, that that was always sort of the way that I wanted it to be, where it was like, I still work a lot. I just stagger my hours. If I have to work at night, um, I will. Um, if I didn't hit a deadline or somebody else didn't hit a deadline or we have something else coming, you know, of course I will. I usually um, I still work on the weekends in the mornings, like I'll work from, I'll get up probably whenever I wake up. So between five and six, I don't set my alarm on the weekends, but between five and six, and I usually work until nine, unless my son has hockey early, which sometimes on Sundays he does, um, usually on Sundays he does. So Saturday, I'll probably work until like nine and then I'll take the dog out. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really interesting when people ask me that because I often, I often feel like slightly embarrassed at how like boring my life is um because I don't I don't have any hobbies but I think I'm a little bit of an anomaly because I'm a single mom I have my kids the majority of the time and I'm I'm the CEO of a business and you know even when I was in my nutrition practice I still I worked way more then than I do now because I make more money per hour now right so you know I think I think having really good goals as to like what you want your lifestyle to be like. And if I could go back in time and change one thing, it's that I would have implemented um, a stricter schedule with stricter boundaries back in the day, right? That's what I would have done. I would not have worked 16 hours a day for five years straight because that's what I did. Um, like, and I'm not even exaggerating. <laughs> um, I had a full-time nutrition practice and I was building this on the side and I only gave up my nutrition practice at the end of 2015. So it wasn't even like super, super long ago. Um, and even when I did that from 2015 to 20, 
17. So for two years, I still worked my face off. Um, and so I think that if I could go back in time and change one thing, it's that I, I would, I would have outsourced faster, even if I couldn't afford it, I would have figured it out. I would have outsourced faster the things that are like the $10 an hour tasks, like scheduling social media, you know, even though it might take like 10 minutes, it's still 10 minutes that I could be with my kids or I could be walking or I could be doing whatever. Um, I would have outsourced faster and I would have put way tighter boundaries around working. Yeah, I fully relate with that. Um, okay, well, we've come up on an hour. Um, knowing that you're talking to an audience of nutritionists, those who are able to join live, and then also everyone else who's going to watch on the replay and hearing the types of questions that were sent in, is there anything else that you want to say before we end off this hour? Yes. With all due respect, everything that you're feeling is normal and you have to just decide to move forward anyway, because those feelings and those thoughts don't go away. They don't go away. And so it's not a reason for you to not do this. Everybody feels like that. I still feel like this. And there's no need for me to feel like this because I've proven everything. So it's part of the human condition to be afraid. And so please, just like all of these questions, they're valid and you can answer them while you're taking action. You have to start. You just have to start. The knowledge that you have, the experience that you have, the compassion that you have, people need it. You don't understand. People need it. And you're too nervous. Stop being so nervous. Just do the thing. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Thank you so much, Lori, for taking this hour out of your mom day and coming and spending some time with us. Uh, I think you've given some really good insights. Um, we will get this replay up in our group shortly. Um, we'll put some of those links there to um, your Facebook group and some of the other resources that you mentioned. Uh, but I appreciate you sharing all of your insights today. That was great. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm happy to do it. All right. You take good care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay.